It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Why was it virtually impossible not to believe in God in, say, 1500 in our Western society, while in 2016 many of us find it more difficult to believe? This is the question that philosopher Charles Taylor tackles in his massive book called A Secular Age. In this episode, James K.A. Smith joins us to talk about Taylor's project. What was it like to believe in God in the past, and what is it like for many believers today, and how did we get here? Whether you find it easy or difficult to believe in God today, James K.A. Smith has a lot to teach you in his book, How Not to Be Secular, Reading Charles Taylor. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. If you enjoyed the Maxwell Institute podcast, please take a moment to rate and review the show on iTunes, share episodes with family and friends, leave comments on the Maxwell Institute's Facebook wall, or on our YouTube channel, where every episode is available for streaming. James K.A. Smith is professor of philosophy at Calvin College and author of the book, How Not to Be Secular, reading Charles Taylor. He's here visiting Brigham Young University with the Wheatley Center this week and had some time to stop by and talk about his book and uh, talking about Charles Taylor's book, A Secular Age. Thanks for taking the time to meet with us. It's great to be here. And you go by Jamie, right? Yeah, so please. You Jamie, okay. Thank good, you. Good, good. Yeah, so I wanted to begin by talking about conditions of belief. Charles Taylor is a philosopher who kind of wanted to write this book about how it is to believe today. It's an incredibly interesting and incredibly long book. Yes, <laughs> it's huge. Indeed. And so you saw a need there to sort of distill this down uh, in, into a shorter book that kind of gives people a little crash course in, in what Taylor's doing. So why this particular book? You're a professor of philosophy, so there's a lot of things you could choose from. Why focus in on Charles Taylor's work? It's interesting. I was teaching a senior seminar on the book, so I had 15 undergraduates who had signed up to spend a semester wading through the 900 pages of the big book, and uh, and they'd made it. And what was intriguing to me was how much this, at times pretty arcane, you know, in the weeds kind of historical philosophical analysis, was actually... Um, existentially illuminating for these 18, 19, 20, 22 year olds. And um, it, it helped them make sense of the world that they live in now, which they felt was significantly different than the world that their parents knew or maybe had prepared them for. And so um, I, I just started to realize that there was a kind of existential bite to Ch Taylor's project that could help um, believers understand something about the water we're swimming in, in terms of, as you put it, the conditions of belief. Um, and, and I think it would be sad if the insight and illumination of that big book didn't trickle down to uh, an audience who I think would benefit from it. Yeah, not everybody has time for, I think it's like 800 pages yeah, or something like crazy. that, the secular yes. age. So it's you've excellent doorstop. It's, yeah, <laughs> and I love the book, but again, yeah. there, there's a time factor. There. So Taylor's looking at these conditions of belief and how they've shifted over time, and he puts the question starkly like this. He asks, why was it virtually impossible not to believe in God in, say, 1500, while in 2000, many of us find this not only easy, but even inescapable. Why frame the book that way? I think what interested Taylor is, every, I think most people have a sense that something changed, right? Like that we, that, that we live in an era of fragmentation, uh, um, uh, all kinds of different beliefs have sort of exploded onto the scene. Disbelief has exploded onto the, you have the rise of the nuns, you have all kinds of different faiths. And I think a lot of people look around and thought, wow, what happened in the 60s to, to engender this? Which is a fair question, but Taylor thinks if you only looked back a generation, you are actually missing the deep, deep, deep roots that got us to where we are today. And so what what Taylor thinks changes are the plausibility conditions. I think he might get that term from the sociologist Peter Berger, right? And um, so what has changed is what is believable. And uh, if you take that sort of 1500 index to 2000 index, um, it's an incredible almost flipping of the script that takes place in the West. Taylor's very uh, careful to qualify that he's telling a Western story, right? 
Um, but in 1500, you know, being an atheist was pretty much unimaginable. Like literally, like it just wasn't a live option that people, being a heretic, sure, but being an atheist, it wasn't a live option. Uh, in, in the sort of centers of the cultured elite in the West today, um, not being an atheist is almost unthinkable. And so Taylor, Taylor, I think rightly suggests, if you wanna really understand what changed there, uh, you have to tell a long, what he calls philosophically inflected history uh, that got us to the present. Inflected. Yeah, so I think what's interesting is, um, in a way, t Taylor's a philosopher, um, but probably about 600 pages of a secular age are history. And it's a, it's a history that only a philosopher could write because on the one hand, it's a history of ideas. On the other hand, he is, because of his philosophical commitments, he's really interested in what you almost might call the material conditions of belief, the social conditions of belief. Um, so it's, it's like, a, a philosopher reading, uh, the history that got us to where we are. And um, in that sense, I think, so Charles Taylor, Canadian philosopher, I might add, we, we fellow Canadians have to stick together. Um, <laughs> some of his earliest work was on the philosopher Hegel. And I think in many ways, Taylor still is Hegelian in this sense, that he thinks history matters. Like what unfolds over time really does make a difference for good or ill. Like there's a story about how history works that we can sort of pin totally. down. And, you, and that doesn't have to turn into some sort of left Hegelian Marxist trajectory about the march of, of you know, spirit or something like that. But it there is this sense that there is things change because of historical accumulations, snowball effects, um, decisions that people make, make a difference because they actually spawn different trajectories. And um, so you, it's, if you want to make sense of faith today, you can't just take a snapshot of the present. What you need is a video, a film that tells this ongoing story, and then you locate the snapshot of the present within that longer yeah, story. Yeah, there's, there's a bigger plot, and he's sort Absolutely. of putting us in the plot, um, different acts, what act are we in now? So let's, let's go to that uh, late, late medieval world that you sort of begin to describe there. This is where Taylor begins his story in, in late medieval world, and he talks about a social imaginary. This is a fancy term. Um, how, how do you explain it to beginners? And then let's talk about what the social imaginary of the late medieval world was. Yeah, I think I love this this concept. Uh, he gets it from a political theorist named Benedict Anderson. The social imaginary, every, everybody has a social imaginary. And the reason he's, he's describing it that way is it's a little bit, uh, sometimes people say everybody has a worldview, right? Um, Everybody has sort of like a, a constellation, an intellectual grid, a constellation of beliefs that help them make sense of the world. Like I, I'm I, a child of God, or I descended from protoplasm that became apes, that became human, or God oversaw a process whereby da da da. So sure, all those are sort of these exactly, plots and of we how often we describe those as belief systems or something like that. And and in that sense, everybody is a believer of something, right? Um, when Taylor talks about this in terms of a social imaginary, what he means to say is almost like lower pre and underneath your beliefs is a way that you imagine the world, which you might never articulate to yourself, but you've actually sort of, you have maybe often unwittingly absorbed a story about who you are, what the world is for, um, and you imagine the world in certain ways, and that's what you take for granted. I mean, your social imaginary is precisely what you take for granted, which is why you don't have to articulate it. And yet, if you look at communities, traditions, epics, um, you'll see that there are different social imaginaries and that they're competing in that sense. And so back in, in the late medieval world, what did the social imaginary look like for someone living at that time? Because we've said, Taylor said, you know, at that point, like 1500 or so, it would have been Im almost impossible to be an atheist. Yes. So what was the social imaginary like then? In part, and I think Taylor sees actually a great deal of continuity from uh, medieval Christian understandings of the world back to ancient. And in this sense, I don't want to confuse us, but in this sense, there's actually 
quite a bit of continuity between paganism and Christianity mm -hmm. in the sense that they share this view, that um, the world is a cosmos that is sort of charged with presences of transcendence, right? Like the world is enchanted. The cosmos is enchanted. There are um, powers and principalities, and Paul says. Absolutely. There, and there are... Um, and, and even if you are... So th there's either a God who, who sort of s s uh, uh, sustains all of this and is present in it and acts within the world, or there are gods and the cosmos is sort of governed by them. So, so in this sense, Aristotle and Plato you know, share a lot in common with Augustine and Aquinas in the sense of an enchanted universe. And, and what that also means is that the materiality of the universe is sort of charged with significance that is always more than the natural. Um, that, that enchantment of the cosmos um, is precisely why you couldn't imagine a world without God or the gods, because then there wouldn't be a world, right? Like this is, it's such a package deal that you would basically be tr entertaining the non-existence of the world or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it would be like saying not just that the sky isn't blue, but that there's no sky. It's like yeah, God or gods and creation went hand in hand. And this also had uh, impacted um, social arrangements. Society itself was sort of grounded in that reality. Is that right about how governments and how... Uh, sure, and you get the natural right of kings. So, so in a way... Um, Social orders, political orders are also taken to be divinely instituted in significant ways. Uh, and that will give rise to, Taylor thinks that there, there come to be reform movements in that late medieval era, precisely because some of this enchanted view of the universe engenders some of its own problems. So that's, yeah, so this is kind of, what, what kind of pressures then came to bear in the late medieval world that began shifting the social imaginary? We're, we're heading up toward the Reformation, mm -hmm. uh, which is when some big shifts happen. What are some of the pressures that, that, that led to that change? Because it seems like a worldview or a social imaginary will shift when it becomes, when, when holes and cracks start to appear in, in, in the foundation. It's of a bit it. like what Thomas Kuhn would call a paradigm shift, right? So your, your, your explanatory paradigm no longer suffices to explain some phenomena that you keep bumping into that you can't make sense of. Yeah, there's so, like an exception to your rule, yeah. and that exception gets bigger and bigger until you're like, okay, this isn't an exception. This is a sign that the system yeah. we have is like not yeah. accurate. And what's interesting to me, I, I think this is really important, is for Taylor, um, this is these are movements that include the Protestant Reformation, but they also include late medieval Catholicism. So he, he very importantly talks about reform movements and not just the Reformation per se. And I think one of the, one of the themes that he emphasizes is um, this, this social imaginary had engendered a kind of two-tiered understanding of both social arrangements, but also the spiritual life itself. So you you get what he calls two-tiered Christianity, where if you're really holy, if you're really spiritual, you're going to be a monk or a nun or a priest, and you're sort of devoted to this kind of sacred way of life that is also in many ways distanced from the mundane domestic realities of inhabiting the world. And it can even like kind of hold it up too, right? Like they had hourly prayers and things. Totally, like absolutely. It's like, hey, like you should be prayerful, but we're also, know that we're praying for you all the time. Like we're on this it's higher true. level of, it's so there's true. a service element to it as well. Absolutely. Uh, they are monks for the world in that sense. But it also came with a little bit of a signal of a kind of, second class citizenship for then those who like had children were butchers and bakers and candlestick makers even though um the spiritual communities needed that work to be done as well it's almost like a spiritual outsourcing that they could do like yeah. they had a lot more like they didn't have dishwashers and and supermarkets they had a lot to, on their hands and so they could outsource some of that extra work to clerics it's a great idea yeah no it's it's a great formulation of it and and it's co it's a complicated story, and, and and Taylor says a lot more details about it. But what he he one of the frustrations that that I think engendered was it didn't fit that well with, for example, the Bible. <laughs> there was there seemed to be a lot of signals in the Bible that you didn't have to uh, step out of just 
good creaturely human vocations in order to please God. And so Paul made tents. Yeah, it's a great that's a great analogy. And and that there are uh, um, that marriage is a good right um, that children are clearly a good that economic life is a good. And so that that tension between that two tiered um, uh, sort of division of labor becomes more and more unsustainable in a way. What kind of things were people talking about at the time to sort of point that out? I mean, uh, were there was there social unrest? Was there sort of pushback against the church? What kind of things were people saying when they started recognizing that they weren't comfortable with that division of labor? So there is there is a political side to this. Um, if we talk about the Protestant Reformation in particular, for example, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Protestant Reformation unleashes a kind of leveling effect of those two tiers because it says actually th this is John Calvin is probably the most um, articulate on this theme all of human life every form of domestic and kind of this worldly vocation is nonetheless lived coram deo in the face of God right so that there's a kind of sanctification of ordinary life that he sees unleashed in the scriptures that affirms all of these kind of mundane domestic formerly quote-unquote secular endeavors as actually now holy um, that they are are uh, uh, ways to worship God to serve God to pursue God and so that levels the two tiers. But there's there's a political side to the story which says this. Our social and political arrangements don't fall from heaven. That in fact, our political systems, our, our national arrangements are, are the product of human cultural making and labor. And so there starts to be this strong suspicion about the divine right of king story that's told. And in fact, what you start seeing is um, if a political order, a social order is seen to be unjust, that there could even be a kind of biblical warrant for revolution <laughs> unleashing in order to actually secure a more just arrangement. Um, this will find its ultimate fruition in John Locke and so on. But that that also had a leveling effect, uh, which you can see unleashed in different parts of Europe and then obviously the United States as well. And you introduced the word secular there, and people might be surprised to find it that early on. But the idea of separating secular and sacred, it was not something that was necessarily new to the Enlightenment. I don't know if the terminology was or not. Maybe you can speak to that. But this idea of separating it basically gets back to this two-tiered existence that we're talking about. So the idea of the secular wasn't necessarily an anti-religious idea or an a-religious idea. In fact, it was a way of of recognizing different roles that different people were playing in societies. Is that a, a fine no? Absolutely. Way to... It was. I, I would have been a very common way for religious folks to talk. Actually, it, it not unproblematic. I don't think, but uh, um, it it did sort of divvy up as you say, from this two-tiered version where there were sacred pursuits which were sort of specifically and um, narrowly concerned with the spiritual, the heavenly, uh, the life to come. And then there would be this worldly, quote-unquote, secular pursuits, which were um, uh, basically mundane domestic life, the sort of creaturely life in that sense. Cooking food, eating food. Yeah making babies, having, raising children, you know, all, all those kinds of things were all good, uh, uh, but they were seen as temporal realities. That actually might be an important theme to introduce is this, the first kind of ancient and medieval understanding of the word secular probably is also tied to not just a meaning to diminish this worldly life, but it's actually tied to really probably the original meaning of the Latin seculum, which is a temporal age, right? So even in St. Augustine in the late 4th and early 5th century, he'll talk about the seculum as an era of history between the fall of humanity and the second coming of Christ, right? And so that's a, that's a kind of contested era age and long era in which humanity finds itself. And Adam has to toil in the 
Yes, you know, exactly. So it's Eve it's, has to do this, yes, but yes. it's temporary. Like God it's can temporary. Fix that. That's the thing. The seculum is an age that is temporary. It's also deeply contested now because of Christ's work and accomplishment and yeah, redemption. Yeah, so did he finish? Yeah, exactly. So right? did he do away so with now the secular it's a, age? It's or... an already but not yet dynamic. And, and especially through Paul, we see him talking about that. It's just like, and, and Christ saying the kingdom is God of God is among you, but also he was talking about the coming of the kingdom. Exactly. Future tense. Exactly. So I think why the ancient and medieval um, uh, believers would also talk about secular pursuits is because what they meant is, well, the kind of things we have to do in this meantime while we're waiting for Christ's kingdom to fully arrive. And they wanted to, th- th- we see Puritanism as one example of something that rises out of this because they, w- yeah. they, they want to actually raise the bar on this and start thinking of every pursuit in a way as being endowed with some sort of sacred significance. Very important. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. There's on the one hand, you could say it's, it's leveling this sacred secular distinction so that all of life is sacred. But then that also has this raising of the bar because that means in a way the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker are called to the same pursuit of holiness that the monks and nuns and priests uh, were called to. And and you can see that, I mean, again, uh, because of my own Christian tradition, I know John Calvin the best, but he, he envisioned, if, if Calvin wanted to kind of break down the walls of the monastery, which he did, it was actually only because he wanted all of Geneva to become a magnum monasterium, he said. He, he wanted the, the entire city to be governed by the rhythms of prayer so that then... Uh, uh, we would undertake all of our vocations as parents, as laborers, as intellectuals in that frame of pursuing holiness. There was also an element of, of or the, another issue that they focused on was sacramentalism. Th- this started to become a point of focus. Maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah. So, and let's say by sacramentalism here, we mean, um, again, this sense that material elements were were uniquely charged with the spirit of God's presence. Like the host of... Like the host. In the sacrament. So in the the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. um, uh, uh, There was something metaphysically real about it. It wasn't just a symbol. Like No, no. it's not just a symbol. It's not just memorial. And so... And you could see how that fits this this view of the cosmos as an enchanted uh, uh, cosmos. And then actual power the priests had to sort of be the yeah, which could you also engender then its own superstitions about it, which are which are, which is exactly what the Protestant reformers were responding to. So once you kind of make this shift, what it does, what happens is you also this becomes particularly true in the later Reformation. You lose the kind of enchantment motif, and now the sacraments, even so, Protestants for baptism and and the Lord's Supper. Um, uh, they just become sort of memorials, symbols. Um, they're, they are not really sort of charged and do something. It's more something that we do to show um, our faith or something like that. It's like something happens, but it's not—the host isn't like a Tylenol. You know, you take it, and then there's these, like— Right. So you lose a kind of— from it. Uh, magic. Now, now, in many ways, that's good because it's not magic, right? Uh, um, uh, well, tail- so we tailored... would say, like, on a pro- from a Protestant perspective, right? I mean, Catholicism still has maintained some of that. In, in they terms would, of but they would still want not want people to think it's magic. Right. I, I think the interesting story to be told here, and I say this is with lots of uh, Roman Catholic friends, it, the gap between sort of official doctrinal understanding of the sacraments. And laity's perception of what's going on in them, there's a huge gap mm-hmm. there yeah. uh, between the two. And and Taylor at one point says, really what happens after the Reformation is all magic becomes black magic, right? And so that therefore you're going to be resistant to any kind of enchantment sort of dynamics. So you get this kind of flattening of the world, this flattening of the universe. And what that means is unwittingly, I really truly believe unwittingly, it's the Reformation that unleashes uh, the beginnings of the disenchantment of the world as a whole. And that had to do with how people viewed the natural world, right? Like today, we're, it, we they went through a period of very mechanistic view of how the world works. Now we see, people see things very naturalistically, like th- there's matter and that's where all reality is and there's nothing beyond that. How did the rejection of sacramentalism, how was that kind of a symptom of 
the rise of scientific worldview and, and sort of the scientific impulse, because that was not originally some sort of atheistic anti-belief no. uh, movement. No. And a lot of people today would say, well, science and religion conflict with each other, and right. clearly one's going to win out over the other. Science, in, in many ways, was an outgrowth of religious uh, e- expression and experience. Very much so, right? The early, certainly if you tell uh, particularly the British story about the origins of science, it comes out of believing communities whose, whose belief in God's activity in designing the world is what motivates their investigation of its laws. On the other hand, I think what happens is um, they're, they're, the methodology of science proceeds in such a way that it is going to investigate the mechanisms and cause and effect dynamics of creation as if it were merely natural, right? And religious uh, folks like us need to realize that turned out to be super successful, yeah. and so I could fly to Salt Lake City today, yes. right? Because because of, we've marshaled certain forces as a, as a result the successful consequence of that methodology. But what happens is uh, the methodology almost flipped and became a social imaginary. There's a fantastic book uh, by a historian of science from Australia named Peter Harrison uh, called The Bible, Protestantism, and the Rise of Natural Science. And I think it is the most sophisticated account of all of these dynamics because what he shows is in some ways it was then the protestant refusal of allegorical interpretation of scripture that engendered a kind of hermeneutic of creation as a whole that also sort of flattened our our reading of the natural world and again this is all very unintentional right um but it 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 starts to treat the world as if it was this and this closed system um and and because of other forces that that continue on you get this mythology that arises as if science is a worldview or is a social imaginary which is not true at all this is part of what what's been described then as a zigzag uh progression to where we're at today there's 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 a story out there as we're tracing the shift from a culture where it's almost impossible to disbelieve in God to one where it seems difficult to believe, Taylor's not offering what he calls a subtraction story. And this is this is something that a lot of people assume uh, the story to be. What What's the substra- subtraction story, and who's telling this story? So a subtraction story about how we got to where we are would be a secularist account of our secular age, because it it goes something like this. Basically, um, humanity in the West used to overlay or attach this kind of supernatural, fantastic, transcendent, uh, enchanted uh, uh, layer or level of the universe onto our natural, physical, rational, uh, cr- universe that we that we know, and what happened is because of enlightenment, um, we basically became illumined to the point that we realized that we first of all didn't need the supernatural transcendent to explain the natural anymore, and then we got to the point where we realized so why do we keep believing in the supernatural and transcendent? Let's just lop that off. And all you're left with is kind of the cold, hard facts of a natural world in which we find ourselves. And that's when we became rational, enlightened, scientific. So, you know, and that and that's what it means to live in a secular age. Like belief today is a vestigial remnant of this this outdated mode. So belief belief is is like uh, um, bad habits that you've still acquired from your crazy grandfather or something because they've been sort of unwittingly. They're memes. Like like this idea of genes being passed on memes, these ideas. Is the, uh, exactly. Pastime. And so that's a subtraction story because what it says is uh, the secular is really just the real world that's left when you throw off the fantastical world of religious belief. And uh, Taylor thinks that that is a completely unsustainable account of where we are for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, he d- just doesn't share that view that the natural world is all there is. He's not a naturalist. And he thinks that any account you tell about our secular age is always informed by your own social imaginary. 
So when Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens tell this kind of story, this subtraction story, he says, well, here's what I want to do. I want to go down and dig down to the basement where they keep all of their own confessional commitments and bring those up to the surface and sort of lay those out to see whether they really work to explain who we are. And in, in a way, I think Taylor's wager, his intellectual wager in this big book is that, in fact, that subtraction story about who we are and how we got here doesn't do justice to the complexity and nuance of what people experience. So he just thinks it's not a it's not a sufficiently explanatory account because what it does is it has to basically shut its eyes to um, phenomena that a non secularist account of the secular could tell. And that that is, I think, what Taylor's trying to what offer. type of phenomena. So what would he point to then? That, so that I think they can't um, account for. I think he would say that the kind of world or the kind of person that, say, uh, Sam Harris imagines as the kind of quintessential, rational, enlightened person is both unbelievably rare and dysfunctional. <laughs> Do you know, like that, 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 that is not, um, and that in fact, there are all kinds of people who aren't traditional religious believers who are grappling with still a kind of lingering longing uh, for a fullness um, that that can't just be explained away as a bad habit. Um, so I, th I think he thinks, uh, not to mention the fact that this account does nothing to explain the explosion of religious belief around the globe. I mean, it's it's a story that makes a lot of sense if you're in like the middle of Oxford or something, or you're sitting in the middle of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, it makes no sense in most of the rest of the world. Is there a sense in which religious and some religious believers have also contributed uh, to that um, sort of view? And I'm thinking in terms of some fundamentalisms and some uh, groups who seem to, I mean, it's almost like they agree with Sam Harris or you know these new atheists on a lot of things. They're just sort of the flip side of it. Totally. We, <laughs> yeah. we shouldn't tell people this, but no, no, this is, I, I would say um, uh, most fundamentalisms are the mere image of modernisms, right? And so what happens is they don't, and, and the apologetics by which we respond to the Harrises and Dawkins and Hitchens of the world often have already conceded so much to their worldview, their methodology, their social imaginary, that it's it's more like you're trying to win the most chairs on the deck of the Titanic. They're on the same ship. They're on this. I, I really feel like the, the, the mode of responding, I, that's why I, I do think Taylor's work is its own kind of apologetic, but not because he's going tit for tat about whether or not the creation reveals the existence of God, right? He's not doing that kind of apologetics. He's doing a much more radical apologetics where he's calling into question these kind of basement assumptions that are behind the whole story that motivates that back and forth uh, together. In a nutshell, that's a huge story, but can you identify some of those that they share in common? I would say um, in, in many ways, uh, a lot of religious apologists act and argue as if the world really just was a deistic one, right? So they're, obviously they're theists, so they, they believe that God exists. But the way that they imagine God's relationship to the world is remarkably extrinsic. So they kind of accept the mechanics of the universe as what laid out. What does that out. deistic God look like? What does that deistic God do? The, so that deistic God is... is um, uh, you know, kicks things going, but then otherwise maintains a rather distant relationship and is not the kind of God who is present in things and meets you in the materiality of the sacraments or um, it's, it's, not, it's not a spirit who enchants the world in significant ways. And uh, so the best that you're going to argue for is a kind of distant deity who started it and is in charge, but isn't personally present 
um, and isn't met. I mean, I, I guess for me, what's most usually missing from those kind of apologetic responses is Jesus. <laughs> like, like there's no, there's no dynamic. It, it, it seems odd to me to, to hinge so much of your public rel religious witness on making the sorts of arguments that by their very methodological commitments preclude appealing to Jesus as the consummate res revelation of God. Um, do you feel like some of the apologetics that even do appeal to Jesus, those sort of buy into some of these assumptions? And I'm thinking in terms of apologetic works that try to um, provide these really strong evidence-based yeah. um, arguments for that Jesus existed or that he... I so I'm a Kierkegaardian in this respect. So I think there is a place for that. Um, and I think that's often that's a legitimate set of questions that believers have to work through. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, when, when you inhabit the space we do, I, I think that that and I think it is unique that Christianity can do that. Right. Because it's a historical. I like just this think was that a historical person. So. It's right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's and it's a deeply historical religion. Uh, I just think that. um even if you were successful in that, that's a long ways from what Kierkegaard calls subjective belief, right? Like that is owning and meeting and encountering that. I should say, by the way, um, you, you pointed out what Taylor calls this zigzag approach. So I, maybe one of the other significant differences between the subtraction story and Taylor's account is that this, the subtraction story is basically a progress narrative, Right. A wig history. It's wig history. It's it's a story of our progressive enlightenment towards disenchanted rationality. It's really easy to believe because we get a new iPhone every yes, year. Yes, right. You know That's I mean? right. Yes. <laughs> and it is. And it's actually it's important to see that it's a story. I, I think Taylor would say people who convert from belief to unbelief are really just converting to an alternative story. Taylor wants to call his a zigzag account because... He's really taking the contingency of history seriously, right? Like he thinks, no, there are kind of contingent decisions and moves and communal developments that take place. And it could have gone otherwise. Like there were there were possibilities for it to have gone otherwise. It all it's also why he doesn't think we're at, he doesn't think secularism in that sort of aggressive sense is necessarily the end of the story, right? Whereas if you're telling a Whig history of of a subtraction narrative, Oh well, we've we've kind of reached enlightenment. Now we've we've got to the end, uh, and, it, and it's going to keep going because all the people who still believe will get there. They'll see what we all see. They'll see exactly. this uh, irrefutable evidence that this is all there is and no God. Exactly, and so that's going to I think prove to be a refutable claim. <laughs> uh, but it's also because Taylor has the sense of the contingency of history. He also thinks that because that's not a very good account of who we are and where we are, it could implode. And there could be opportunities for faith in the future um, that we that might be hard for us to imagine now. Uh, I, I think when I got to interview Taylor a few years ago, one of the things that struck me is how much his account engenders for him hope. Um, so it's not a despairing narrative. What What... What would there be to despair? But just this idea that religion would just be erased over time, and yeah, and yeah, that it would wither on the vine, that. that that it would be uh, um, gobbled up by uh, either the state and or science or um, consumerism or whatever it might be, and and you tell the story whereby uh, you know communities that foster faith completely shrivel, and what's the possibilities going forward, or at least a despair that. Um, religious believers would become such grotesques within our public spaces that th we would be the freak shows on the margin. Um, and, and I think I, I'm sometimes I worry that some of my co-religionists um, buy into that narrative of despair. And I mean, I understand there are political and social developments that, that could motivate that. I don't think that's a posture that Christians could ever take. Uh, I think hope is both commanded and possible. <laughs> um, and and I think Taylor, though, gives you the nuances of a history that also explain wh why, if you despair right now, you actually are accepting the secularist account of our secular age. Without looking at the history of yeah. how the ideas have really played out. Yeah, and, and, and because you're also not taking history seriously. You've bought a progress myth, 
and you think, oh, this is where we're, you think it's a straight line trajectory. Taylor is saying, look, the spirit zigs and zags. Do you think there's been a sense in which some believers, though, have contributed to their own disbelievability when when they align themselves with reactionary things? There's this idea that, okay, we understand it's not this straight line of progression. History is not just on an uptick, but that can that can become a bad attitude to have in the event that people stand in the way of uh, of, of things that do need to progress. I'm thinking like racism, for example, or sure. something like climate change, where we don't want to face up to that. We'd rather keep life the way it is right now. And these scientists, these atheist scientists are trying to trick us with these types of things. It's kind of a caricature, but it's this idea of feeling like skeptical of science, skeptical of the academy on the part of believers that then you know, it's that's not an appealing way to appeal to a scientist. Like, like if you make no, yourself an and, enemy of science, and and um, enclosing ourselves in enclaves is not a way to bear witness to how the world could be otherwise. I, I think um, the Christian community since the beginning has always been trying to figure out this dance of how to be in the world but not of it and how to be faithfully present to a culture without assimilating to the culture. And so it it really depends on what demon you're trying to exercise. I, I really do believe that the dynamics of assimilation is a real challenge. But in other more, for lack of a better term, fundamentalist community, you might say the dynamics of isolation are precisely what need to be challenged. And it's it's so easy to fall off the wagon on either side there. I think one of the other reasons why Taylor's account interested me is because it helped to make sense of the extent to which Christianity, and I would say probably especially Protestant Christianity, became overwhelmingly assimilated to this modernist, enlightenment, disenchantment story. And and you get that. I mean, so uh, um, the engines that really drive it, say in Immanuel Kant, um, is is a sort of Lutheran, you know, German Protestant who who basically, because of other reasons, has decided to cast his lot with this sort of project. And and I think you're seeing that in in mainstream Christian mainline Christian denominations uh, in the West. But I think we're increasingly, I think that's um, that's true of my evangelical sisters and brothers too. That we don't even realize the extent to which we sort of got in bed with the enemy. That's James K.A. Smith. He's professor of philosophy at Calvin College and author of How Not to Be Secular, reading Charles Taylor. I I was going to ask, too, why the bracket around not? So if you look at the book, how not to be secular, not is in uh, parentheses. So, I mean, that's kind of a clever... Yeah. Thing. So it's it, and and it's um yeah, it's sort of clever pomo kind of yeah. uh, trick, but it's also <laughs> it's trying to get at something which is um Taylor would say, look. Um the question is not whether or not you'll be secular. <laughs> because in this sense, because the secular is the water we swim in. It's not a belief system per se, right? So to talk when there's a reason why his book is called A Secular Age. Because what he's saying is, look, this is how, as we've said, the plausibility conditions of our Western societies have shifted. And so now the question is how to be secular, how not to be secular. You could also say how to believe in a secular age, but also how not to believe in a secular age. Yeah, yeah. there's a double meaning. Don't believe in this version of what a secular age could be. Yes. It's all sorts of very playful. Yes. Yes. And also don't believe your faith this way anymore. Yeah. Uh, So it it impinges on both a critique of secularism, but it also is an invitation for uh, believers to become just a little bit more culturally aware and therefore newly intentional about their faith in the context. And I think that's probably especially true as we think about how we hand on the faith uh, to young people for whom they literally can't, f- they don't know even the shifts that we've seen in our life lifetimes. Uh, all they know is what we see today. Uh, and, and I think that creates its own challenges for faith formation and faith traditioning in the sense of handing on. Yeah, you, there's this quote in your book um, where you say, we're all secular now. We've talked about this a little bit already, but um, you include believers in this idea. Let's let's expand on that a little bit more about um, how everyone 
is in this secular age, what what our yeah. social imaginary looks like today. So one of the features of a secular age, as Taylor explains it, is that it's um, it's an era, it's a society in which faith is contested, right? So what, for, for Taylor, what, what it means to say we live in a secular age is to say we live in a society in which no one's beliefs can be taken to be axiomatic for everyone. There's no kind of default belief in a sense, because we all are aware that we have neighbors who believe things other than we do. So there's this, there's this fracturing, there's this, what he calls fragilization of belief so that even if I do believe uh, a traditional faith today, I have to realize that there are all kinds of people around me who don't believe it. And therefore I have to recognize that it's both contested and contestable. So in that sense, uh, even the most ardent, devout religious believers today believe differently than our 11th century sisters and brothers did. So why look at our history then? Why, why, why read the accounts of an 11th century monk um, who's talking about spirituality? Ah, precisely because I would say um, there is a well of wisdom and tradition there then that also gives us almost like a an intellectual marketplace advantage because we and this is why I it's think very 21st century way of yeah. <laughs> marketplace. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I, I really feel this, though, like I, I feel like I as a as a Christian scholar who works in the academy, I feel like I am position to be more creative and more imaginative precisely because as a Christian, I also see myself as the heir of wisdom and traditions that are older uh, than the 20th century for sure. And older than modernity. And um, obviously I'm going to have to receive those in a creative appropriation if, if that's going to be live wisdom for today. But I, I actually think this is what really distinguishes religious communities in a secular age is that we have a posture towards the past that is radically different, right? That we, we aren't characterized by the sort of chronological snobbery that gives in to the tyranny of the present. Um, and, and therefore we can recover uh, wisdom and sort of redeploy it um, in, in the present. What's the Nova effect that Taylor talks about that is part of the... Yeah, so because, let, let's think of it this way. Um, we all, believers and unbelievers alike, find ourselves in this fraught secular context in which belief is contested and contestable. What that means is, um, because of that, we all experience different pressures on our modes of believing. And that it's almost like that pressure keeps exerting itself. And for Taylor, that includes the pressure of the transcendent <laughs> pushing on unbelievers, right? That, that creates this almost like pressure cooker situation of like, I don't know what to do with all of this. And so what you get is this explosion. It's it, the Nova is this sort of like, I think it's an astronomical picture, this explosion of different kinds of ways of believing. So on the one hand, you will have traditional religious communities endure, but now you get all kinds of reconfigurations and, and uh, syncretistic new age, uh, and new age, of... but also Oprah and Elizabeth Gilbert and eat, eat pray, pray love, love and all that. Kind of, right. All of those are actually, if you think of it, they are basically kind of secularist ways of still trying to hold on to a way of being spiritual. Yeah. They're like scratching this transcendent itch or something. Exactly. And, and Taylor thinks that the kind of account that Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins give you... These are the new atheist thinkers. ...doesn't give you... doesn't do justice, actually, to that kind of burbling up in the human person that keeps looking for that. It seems like older atheists did, though. Like, I kind of feel like we have this really cheap brand of atheism today where I'm like... Give I'd me Nietzsche yeah. <laughs> any day. Like, come on. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And you... Because you also got to... Nietzsche was the last atheist who actually understood Christianity. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's it's a more robust engagement than sort of the pop culture stuff we get today. Absolutely, they're, they're with, it, with it, all of its caricatures of belief and so on. So this Nova effect creates more pressures because the more we see plurality, the more it's difficult to say, especially for Christianity that looks at Jesus Christ, it's, it's a fairly exclusivist, yeah. uh, to use that term, uh, idea that people are saved through Jesus. And so we see so many different uh, possibilities and ways of belief out there. So it becomes hard then and almost... Uh, the idea of colonialism gets introduced here because it's almost like we're trying to bring our religion to, I don't want to do away with this culture and bring in, you know, this is sort of a mentality that people might have as they're approaching things with Christianity. So how do you situate Christianity within this place where we see a plurality of beliefs, some of them very laudable, uh, many of them having uh, much in common? How do you situate the role of, of Christianity then in this while the ANOVA effect is going on and while we're facing these cross pressures and this religious pluralism? Well, um, you'd almost have to talk about Christianities, right? Mm -hmm. So um, clearly one of the sort of trajectories out of that NOVA explosion are forms of Christianity that basically have just decided to concede the secular right like that that so you you see this in mainline protestant denominations you see it again i i, I just think shockingly in in sort of post evangelical uh folks who think the only way to liberate themselves from fundamentalism is to basically relearn protestant liberalism and, and in that it's case basically just a complete myth mythologization if, if i can use that word of Christianity, like this is just a story that we tell ourselves yeah. so that we'll be nice to each other until yeah. we die, kind of. Thing. And 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 I see this in in certain younger generations of, um, I don't really know about all the particulars of Christianity, but I really like justice. So I'm gonna justice becomes a new religion in right. a sense, right? Um, that that's one trajectory that it can go. On the other hand, um, so you hate justice, then I see. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. <laughs> no, no, I see what you right, mean. Right, but you can see you can yeah. make an idol out of justice. Right. Any any particular point in isolation. Yeah. Basically, you're not looking at what your underlying yes. social imaginary has become when you single out something like exactly like justice. Yeah. On the other hand, I do also think that there are notable trends and trajectories of people responding to the disenchantment of the world by actually being attracted to enchanted sacramental forms of Christianity. So it, for all those Protestant evangelicals who are basically running off to learn how to be mainline liberal Protestants, there you'll also find some who are converting to Eastern Orthodoxy and Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism. Or, and I, I get out in the country a lot, and what's intriguing to me is how many evangelical Protestant, even non-denominational congregations are like taking the Lord's Supper weekly uh, and, and have a pretty rich sacramental vision. So to me, there, there has been an interesting catalyst for recovering enchantment precisely because of this onslaught of disenchantment. Pentecostalism is probably another... Uh, I uh, firmly stream. believe that Pentecostalism is... Uh, its own kind of sacramentalism. They would never, ever use that term. I say this as somebody who used to be Pentecostal. Mm. and um, But it is a deep sense of the Spirit meeting you in materiality. And I think it takes embodiment in worship really seriously. I think that's why it takes healing really seriously. Mm -hmm. Speaking in tongues. Absolutely. And if you if you look at global Christianity, it is Pentecostal Christianity mm -hmm. yeah. for the most part. So that's sort of a return to, f there are these pressures of something else, something more. Uh, yeah. that, that people are so yes. looking for. I think we see that within the LDS tradition as well. Mm, mm. Um, when we come back um, to, to wrap up the interview, we'll talk a little bit more about um, these cross pressures, especially for this really interesting phenomena of um, skeptical s skeptics or doubting believers uh, that we see. So uh, we'll take a break and then come right back. Do you have questions or doubts about your faith? You're not alone. Many faithful members wonder about aspects of LDS Church history, belief, or practice. Everyone needs a reliable and faithful place to work through questions. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship and Deseret Book offer such a place in a book called Planted, Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt by Patrick Mason. Planted offers an empathetic, practical, and candid perspective for people struggling with questions and people who love those who struggle. Planted is available now at Deseret Book and online retailers like Amazon.com.
We're speaking today with James K.A. Smith. Jamie is a professor of philosophy at Calvin College and author of How Not to Be Secular, reading Charles Taylor. And I should also express gratitude today for the Wheatley Center for bringing Jamie out to Brigham Young University to speak to uh, students and faculty on some of the work that he's done. Um, I wanted to talk about a very interesting part of your book, and it's actually how you kind of start things out. Uh, You talk about a figure who isn't really a religious believer, they're atheist or maybe even just agnostic. They're not really particularly concerned with God or religion. Maybe they had bad experiences in religion, and, and they just they have enough going on in their life that they don't feel a very strong pull to find religion. They've got a family. They've got different things like this. But but there are these questions that haunt these, uh, these people, these questions about what happens when we die, these questions about... Um, what? Why are there all these religions and all, these types of pressures that come down? And you, you bring up this song by the Postal Service uh, um, that you say, you know, it's this pop song. It seems like some triviality, but then all of a sudden you start hearing these lyrics that about looking and through the glass, through where, the light the glass where the light bends at the cracks, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, pretending the echoes belong to someone. Why this song? Talk about this song and this person that you're describing. Yeah, well, and I I think almost anything Ben Gibbard has written uh, fits here, which is, I do, I think there are interesting pop cultural phenomena that the Harrises and Dawkins can't explain, which point to the extent to which our people in our society who are not religious are still haunted by transcendence. They try to explain it. They'll say that this is a... You know, the consciousness itself is just a side effect of biological processes. They can't prove that, though, right? So and, they'll offer a story. Right. It's just nothing that can be actually proven. And, and I would say um, what's going on there is that the explanation is fundamentally unsatisfactory for a kind of inborn urge and longing for fullness, right? That That... I and Taylor would both say is a feature of being created in the image of God. And so uh, it, now you could basically you could look at and listen to this and say, well, why don't they get with the program and believe in God? That OK. But there's also a sense in which you could say, isn't it interesting that they're not willing to say I'm an atheist? Right. Or there, there's 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 just the messiness. I, I find the messiness of late modern culture around these questions. Uh, for me, it's an intriguing opportunity and a reason to be hopeful. And there's there's other examples, but it's it's the sense that, okay, in a secular age, I do think we have to grapple with the fact that doubt is going to be a companion of faith. This is the flip side of it, is you have believers who doubt strongly. Yes. And, so and I got, think... you've got di- uh, people who don't believe who, like this figure in the song, start feeling something pushing in, but then you have believers who are like, where's God? Look what, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, and I, I, and I think there's, there's results, or there's implications for both of this. On the one hand, I do think it's very important for religious communities that are thick, you know, and intentional to make room to realize that God is not scared of our doubt, right? The, the, I, I think the Psalms of lament are like canonized expressions of doubt right yeah like so this isn't a new thing this is it's not new interestingly but it's, enough. it is more intense now and i think it's, and it's more in its common. own social imaginary it's yes. a different social imaginary yeah. but but so if if believers can be haunted by doubt what that also means is that unbelievers can be haunted by faith right they can be tempted to believe and and have you uh, met people like this that talk to you this way that, sure absolutely and and some of them some of them what they'll do is they they actually try to cover over that what I would say is an imaginary dynamic, and not, not like fictional, but that it's mm-hmm. at the level of the social imaginary. What they do is they try to cover it over by having an intellectual debate, a bunch, bunch of ideas. I almost always perceive that that's a kind of defense measure against actually exposing them to the existential pull of the spirit. And we can also see believers doing that with apologetics as well, is sort of like staving off doubt with this anxious shoring up of, here's all these reasons. Yes, yes. You know, um, Kurt Cobain, another uh, Seattle-based 
crooner, so to speak, uh, once quipped, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. And uh, I've often thought, you know, there could be a similar quip, which would be something like, uh, just because you're haunted doesn't mean there aren't ghosts, right? Like yeah, there's, yeah. And it could be the Holy Ghost that, that's sort of priming. And, and I think ultimately what Taylor is trying to offer is he's just trying to clear the intellectual space for an account of those phenomena that takes seriously the possibility that there is a more, that there is a spirit, that there is a transcend, that there, that it's actually God knocking, um, and and that you can't just rule that out as an explanatory account. So in in many ways, I think. A Secular Age is one of the most powerful works of Christian apologetics that we've had in the last generation. Um, it's just very sophisticated, very complicated, and um, very nuanced. And it isn't just trying to win points uh, or score a win in a debate. It's actually trying to just change the debate itself. Like put the debate in a bigger context. Totally. That. And I, yes. I think that's why some people won't be interested in it because— like you said, some people just want to argue the yes and no's. They yeah. want to just go through the typical uh, critical lists or apologetic lists. And this is a conversation that actually encompasses that conversation. And so some people don't yeah. aren't inclined to zoom out. And, it, and it's why Taylor ends his book by saying, in many ways, the most powerful pictures of faith that have a lure about them are going to come from artists, right? So he talks about poets, he talks about novelists, he looks at Gerard Manley Hopkins, Flannery O'Connor, uh, um, uh, this sense that it will be precisely modes of bearing witness to fullness and transcendence that appeal to the imagination that actually will probably move people um, to, cons to truly consider that God is the one that's calling them. How about transcendence in imminence? Is, this, is there a sense in which we also need to be, and I'm thinking of Adam Miller's work within the LDS tradition, this idea that instead of viewing God as this person out in, the, in someplace out there, but also God as deeply a part of um, finding grace, I think he actually locates it within mm -hmm. grace, finding grace within ordinary things. Absolutely, but that, that's exactly sacramentalism. Right. So sacramentalism is precisely not divvying up a sort of natural, flattened, imminent space from a distant other transcendent space. The, the sacramental imagination is ultimately an incarnational imagination, which is that God breaks in, is present in and inhabits uh, the the imminent, the, the mundane, the worldly. So you, you get over that dichotomy a little bit. So to conclude then, how this is a twofold question then. How does how does Jamie Smith, a prof, a professor of philosophy, live his faith today? And what kinds of suggestions do you give to people who are those faithful doubters who who it's almost the hope is always there. The they can't bring their brains around all the time to it. Yeah. But they want to live, you know, they, they, they want that, they need that. So how, how has that played out in your personal life, in your faith and scholarship? And what yeah. do you suggest to students or other people that you've counseled? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say um, for myself, what I've realized is it is crucial for me to remain committed to a congregational center of my life and the practices and disciplines that come with that, because that's what fuels my imagination, my, my social imaginary. Um, in such a way that I can then be centered to go out and be engaged in a, in a fraught, uh, uh, cross-pressured space like the academy. So I, I know that in a way, if, if, you, um, if I was just trying to pull this off intellectually on my own sources, uh, in a way, you, you know, it's like taking an ember from the flame and eventually there's no way that it stays bright. So there's, there is... And, and I'm actually really committed to the fact that congregations, worship, uh, the, the disciplines of, of Christian communities shape and form me in such a way that I'll have the capacity to be able to do that. Um, so that when I'm out and about, I think a big part of my work in those kinds of pluralistic contexts is often trying to deconstruct the caricatures of Christianity that, that my quote unquote opponents have. So just this past Monday night, I was at New York university and did a, a public event with, uh, um, an atheist, uh, uh, philosopher named 
uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah, who's a noted law professor and things like that. And he talks about what he calls cosmopolitanism as this sort of imminent ethical worldview. And um, I think some people were looking for this fireworks of debate between the Christian and the atheist. And instead, I, I wanted to sort of show how and why a religious believer can actually affirm a lot of the goods that he's concerned about, but then also to try to point out why I think actually Christianity offers better resources for achieving what he wants mm -hmm. than what he has in his, I was going to say secular tradition, but he, he kind of owned up to the fact that there's not a tradition yeah. there and there's not a community of practice. Right. Uh, and it was interesting actually to see um, we still live in an age where someone like that will, will in the conversation concede that it was his own early Christian formation that sort of bubbled up and engendered some of these sensibilities. And Taylor kind of talks about how that happened wholesale in culture. That exactly. There's, that in David fact, David Bentley Hart's talked about that too. I yes, think, very how, much. Yeah. I, I think that's important. There, there's a macro story to be told here that, that the secular ethical concern, what, what Taylor calls the modern moral order, um, is actually impossible if the West didn't come through Christianity, yeah. right? which which universalized a concern for the neighbor. Or at the very least, it would not be what it is today. It would not at be the what very it least. is today, yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Okay, so it seems you're basically saying for you, you found a way of communalism helps your faith, being tied to a tradition that, that connects you with the transcendent, but also engaging with the broader world, broader society, uh, seeing what what the needs and the impulses are there and translating Christianity for that and also showing how Christianity can sort of fill in gaps that they might be experiencing. Yeah. So you'd encourage believers to sort of do that. Yeah, and it's what uh, my friend James Davis and Hunter calls faithful presence. So on the one hand, you're cultivating faithfulness in these formative communities. And by the way, I should also say, for me, it's significant that that's a sacramental community, right? Um, but then you are sent from there to be present to the culture uh, in ways that you hope both bear witness, but also uh, could have some influence. Are you going to be changed there too? The, and that's why you need to be aware of those dynamics. That's actually uh, a lot of the concern of my other sort of research trajectory in the new book I have coming out next week, which is uh, um, how do we become attentive to the degree and ways in which we are assimilated when we are sent, which is why you need this kind of centripetal dynamic of coming back to the formative center of the community to be reformed, to be resent. Yeah. So um, would you be, would you feel comfortable saying, thank God for sec for the secular and also please God help us with the secular, like are both of those things acceptable? Because a lot of times, secular is a bad word for religious right. believers. Like, yeah, it's a it's a very good question. I don't know that I have two cheers for the secular. <laughs> two. Um, though I I think uh, maybe I have one cheer insofar as um, if included in that was actually this revalorization of this worldly life as a, as an arena for faithful uh, pursuit of God, I think that that part of it, I think, is actually really crucial. And I think I also probably welcome, no matter how much I love Downton Abbey, I still probably welcome the fact that we unleashed certain revolutionary capacities to realize that the political order is something that we're responsible for and is not just handed down by the divine right of kings. That um, seems to make space for religious plurality. I think that's it does. Isn't the secular I mean, important in that sense of making it free, freedom of religious expression actually seems to be kind of a secular idea in that sense. Of like, but, but I would say I think it is, it is a good idea in the seculum in which we find ourselves. Obviously, my hope and longing is uh, an, a, a kingdom in which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the meantime, I think religious uh, pluralism and religious freedom is the best way to grapple with the contested and contestability of faith uh, in the meantime. Does free choice have anything to do with that as well? The idea that I'm a then, Calvinist, so we should probably not talk about free choice. Good. We'll close on that then. I really appreciate it. Great. Jamie, for stopping in today. That's James K.A. Smith. He's a professor of philosophy at Calvin College and author of the book, How Not to Be Secular, reading Charles Taylor. And what's the title of the book that you have coming out? It's called You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. Good. I'll definitely check it out. Maybe we'll even uh, talk about it on a future episode or something. That'd be great. But again, thanks to the Wheatley Center here at Brigham Young University and to James K.A. Smith. Thanks for for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast.